Among this year's momentous elections, it's now America's turn to decide. Its result will resonate far beyond US borders, and in the case of Donald Trump, could even embolden the far right in Europe. Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, with the result of the US election imminent, Europe has been considering how to react if the former president, Donald Trump, wins. For some populist parties, it's likely to be welcome news. So how much will a Trump victory energize them? We want to make America great again. It's very simple. We want to make America great again, and that's what we're going to do. Once again, we hear that slogan. Donald Trump capturing the nationalist mood as Americans place their vote at the ballot box. It's a message that will no doubt resonate with their far-right populist parties on the other side of the Atlantic. And his presidential rival is warning voters about his relationship with some of them. Trump won't hold autocrats accountable because he wants to be an autocrat himself. Yeah. And as president, I will never waver in defense of America's security and ideals because in the enduring struggle between democracy and tyranny, I know where I stand and I know where the United States belongs. As the world awaits the result, some leaders are hoping for a Trump victory. If God helps us, the pro-war people will be replaced by those who are pro-peace in America and President Trump will return, and then we will be relieved because we will no longer be alone, and at least there will be two of us. It is no secret that Orban is counting the days to work again with his slogan inspiration. And other leaders who have adopted similar policies close to his are now becoming visible in Europe. From Hungary to Austria and Slovakia to Germany and France illiberal leaders and parties across Europe view Trump as a model to emulate. With election results just around the corner, will 2024 mark a shift towards autocracy and far-right policies, or will democracy push back? Let's meet our guests. Joining us from France in Saint-Malo, we have Jacques Rolland. He is a senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute. In the Black Forest in Germany, we have Peter Kuras, He's a journalist who covers extensively the rise of far-right extremism in Germany. And I'm delighted to say here with me in the studio, we have William Alcorn. He's a senior research fellow at the Anglia Ruskin University and a visiting associate professor in politics and international relations at Richmond American University in London. You're all very welcome to this round table. William, I'll come to you first of all. Viktor Orban has put a lot of effort into this relationship already with Donald Trump, hasn't he? I mean, if Trump wins the election, is Orban now going to be Trump's go-to man in Europe? Yeah, I think there's lots of synergies within their programs. They've um, met on several occasions recently in the summer. Um, this brand of kind of Christian nationalism um, is quite um, a kind of building basis for their relationship, as well as issues around sort of immigration and uh, border wars um, as well. So I think they're, they're on to, yeah, quite... Um, favourable relationship um, going forward. And Trump's people will look at Orban and I think they'll be impressed because he served a term, he lost, but then he bounced back quite brilliantly. And I think they'll be hoping that Trump can do the same. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, um, yeah, looking at Orban, his, his kind of trajectory from being fairly liberal, um, changing political stripes more recently and then coming back um, is quite um, an interesting kind of rise of, of populist nationalism. So they would be interested in kind of emulating that um, and particularly uh, using the same kind of playbook going forward. Jacques, how will European leaders like Emmanuel Macron, Olaf Scholz and Keir Starmer feel if Trump becomes president and his first port of call is Viktor Orban, you know, the strongest relationship he will have in Europe if he's looking to Orban before he's looking to the Elysee or number 10 Downing Street? Oh, that's fiction politics. But uh, yes, uh, 
the, the list the list I can say is that they will not be very pleased with an election of uh, Donald Trump because Donald Trump is a very a big threat for Europe and you know our Macron is uh, committed to the European ideal and uh, they fear that Trump would probably kind of ally with Putin in order to undermine the EU. The EU is seen as a counter model, which none of neither of them likes at all. Uh, they would like the dismantling of the EU or the disunion of the EU. At the same time, it will uh, raise lots of issues about uh, European security and will uh, probably, on one hand, Macron and some, maybe not Macron, but there are some people in France who think that uh, an election of Trump will be a wake, up, a wake up call for Europe and will help Europe move towards more autonomic strategy, even though they still need, they are a long way from having a common defense and security policy and of having the means to defend themselves. But I think it might be the little, uh, the moment in which Europe will finally wake up and stop having this childish relationship with the uh, USA. Peter, just come in on that. What is it about Donald Trump that European far-right leaders like and admire so much? I don't know that I would want to speak for European right. far-right far leaders broadly. Um, and I think within Germany, we see that they actually have, in many cases, quite conflicted relationships to Trump. I think there are a lot of leaders on the far right who are not very respectful, for example, of Trump's relationship to the military. Um, I think there are a lot of leaders on the far right here who still have much more traditional ideas about discipline and about family, for example, than, than Trump represents. So I'm not sure that they actually like him that much. You know, one important thing from a German perspective, certainly for the far right, is that Trump has at least flirted with the use of Nazi ideology. Um, and I think it legitimates for the far right you know, if he can do it, then we can do it. If he can say the Nazis weren't all bad, then we can say that. Um, but I'm not sure that the far right in general will actually turn out to like him consistently that much more than the centre will. William, just to you on that, is it a shared dislike of migrants that's at the core mm -hmm. of what the far right see in Trump and what he kind of likes about them as well? Yeah, I think it's definitely a form of kind of xenophobic nativism, um, which is at the core of a lot of populist radical right parties. Um, but it's, it's interesting in terms of looking at support bases, it's also this outsider status that a lot of these parties occupy within the political system and this kind of maybe despair at the, the mainstream um, parties um, fueling a lot of the rise of these movements. So um, that's it. Those prejudices are, are kind of a core um, appeal, but there's also this kind of protest uh, potential as well. And Tammy, do you think a Trump victory will really energise the far right across Europe? That if they see him bouncing back, the way he speaks, the rhetoric, mm. the bombast, the disdain for migrants, do you think that will really empower and energise the far right? Yeah, I think rhetorically at least, um, a lot of the parties when he first came to power um, adopted a lot of the same kind of culture war framing, fear politics around migration, and also attempts to kind of mainstream their ideas. So um, kind of tapping onto kind of common um, kind of concerns, um, but then using that as an extension to, to add um, some more kind of anti-immigration uh, flavor to those. So there's kind of, yeah, um, the if Trump effect um, that we saw with the last one that will, might roll over into this um, election cycle too. Jacques, talk to us about the French relationship with Trump. How, how do French people see him? The French people don't like him as a, as a rule. That's what the problem is for Marine Le Pen. Because Marine Le Pen and her party uh, share many of the views, the same views as Trump. Uh, especially regarding immigration, law and order, uh, and uh, the idea of France and Europe as a Christian, uh, a Christian country opposed to multiculturalism. Uh, and uh, therefore, there, there will be the fact that these themes helped him win the election. 
will boost their confidence. But at the same time, Marine Le Pen and her supporters will be very wary of supporting him uh, really strongly and vocally because there's a strong dislike on the part of uh, the French electorate at the dis the the disregard for the rule of law, even though the Le Pen have often dis- used the same method as uh, as uh, as Trump by saying that the rule of law is not that important. The will of the people is more important. But the French are very attached to the Republican institution and to the principle of the rule of law, which is equal for everyone and which protects people's liberties. And we saw that in the election in uh, in June, in June and July, when the French rebelled against the possibility of a national front government, which would overthrow uh, willingly the Republican values to which the French are attached, and they realize that it is very important. The French are very political people, and they would not like. Uh, they, they, are, they have a strong belief in the, in the value of institutions, which Trump completely disregards. We see the Supreme Court has no role and so on. While in France, the National Front would like to get rid of the Constitutional Court, which kind of can declares laws uh, unconstitutional and they prevent them, even though they've been uh, voted by a majority of the people. So that's why uh, they will be pleased. It will boost their confidence. It will also inspire their style, the style of Trump, where truth is relative, where you can lie your way through arguments uh, with aplomb. And we can see that approach, we can already see it in the interviews of some leaders of the National Front who completely uh, disregard the truth. And they're in line with the view that uh, today people don't believe what they see, they see what they believe. Peter, we've seen results that a lot of people couldn't believe and were quite shocked about in Germany this year. State elections where the AFD did so very well. Do you think a Trump victory will embolden that political party in particular? I think the AFD itself has been emboldened for a very long time. The AFD is about as bold as you could be already. You know, whether it grants some Germans a kind of feeling of legitimacy in voting for the AFD is another question, and I consider that possible. But at this point, I think those lines have already been split, you know, are are pretty clearly drawn. And while we may see the AFD pick up a slightly larger share of the vote, particularly in the West going forward, based on Trump's election, I think the more present concern in my mind is that it undermines the legitimacy of the parties in the center, which are already struggling to to, to present something like a, a political program and struggling to present something like a mandate for the people. And I think, you know, Trump's sort of attitude of chaotic resentment as a a constant mode is really appealing even to politicians in the center in Germany. And, you know, I think it will embolden a kind of bad behavior across the board. And Peter, just tell me, he reiterates the phrase, America first, make America great again. That's effectively what AFD have been doing in Germany for years, isn't it, coming out with this stuff? I think there's a lot of truth in that, for sure. And there's a lot of the connection to sort of nationalist ideologies that's very present and very shared between the two groups. Um, You know, there's a sort of commitment, though, to aristocratic ideals, a commitment to hierarchies, a commitment to, you know, Teutonic discipline in some cases in the AFD that I think is pretty far from Trump. Um, And at the same time, you know, you've seen certainly in the last year the center of German politics has kind of lost its way. You know, I think we now see people don't really know what the centrist position about Ukraine and Russia is. People certainly don't know how to find a sort of moderate position that respects human rights in both Israel and Palestine um, in terms of the war there. And, you know, I think even in terms of economic positions or economic kind of arguments that might seem more dull and mundane, the center now is really struggling to find common cause and kind of find a common way to understand the German recession and particularly the 
the limitation on new debt, the, the so-called Schuldenbremse. Um, nobody really knows what to do about that. So I think what we're seeing really is that the center is is hollowed out. And though the far right, you know, the AFD is not a strong party. I don't think Trump is a strong leader either. You know, I think they're benefiting from the weakness of, of the sort of center of the, of the society in both cases. William, Peter used a phrase there, chaotic resentment, Trumpian politics. But that's very much at the heart of everything the far right do and say in every country from Germany, Austria, France, even in the United Kingdom this year. Yeah, it's a stoking of kind of politics around fear, uh, fear of the outsider, fear of the other. Um, this kind of siege mentality almost um, day to day um, that we've seen and, and that was wrapped up in some of the comments that Trump was talking about in Ohio and um, Pennsylvania, true on true about people eating their pets um, from a migrant background. Um, and this is it's not just fueled by politicians, it's fueled by the press as well. Um, over many years um, and yeah um, chaotic nature of the administration is part of the populist playbook uh, trying to come across as not too te uh, technocratic a bit more kind of down to earth and part of the people um, but we've seen how this kind of also trips up a lot of these leaders with Trump being on the end of a lot of um, charges um, relating to um, trying to overturn some of the results of the elections um, and also his yeah, uh, broader kind of business dealings. Um. Shaq, I saw an interview with the outgoing head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. He was asked about any advice he would give to Europe about Donald Trump possibly coming back, and he said, work with him. I guess that's what a lot of European capitals and leaders will be resigned to, won't they? I mean, they, if he wins this election, they've got to work with him. Yes, they will have to work with him. We saw already when he was elected uh, in 2016 how keen was Macron to try to engage with him, but without much success, even though there was loads of pump and loads of uh, taps on the shoulder and uh, friendly words. It was very difficult because uh, Trump is not someone who can be convinced by sometimes rational arguments. He's got his view. And the big fear, uh, the big fear is that there is this... Uh, connection between uh, Trump and Putin. And Europe feels, and uh, the European leaders, especially France, feel to be caught between them. And will Trump, first of all, stop uh, the big the big issue? We'll see. The first test will be, obviously, the attitude towards Ukraine. And uh, it's, you know, you, uh, Trump has said that he will have a plan within five minutes or 24 hours of being elected. Uh, I don't think so. But it looks as if, in that case, uh, the support for Ukraine will dwindle, for, apart from the Americans. The Europeans are not able to compensate for the loss of American uh, financial and military support. So it would definitely raise, make, uh, lead to a solution which would force maybe Zelensky to deal with Putin and accept the status quo now. Uh, basically, uh, Ukraine uh, remained, but uh, amputated from uh, the Donetsk uh, region, the regions occupied by Russia, which is something which would appeal to uh, many people in Europe, especially on the far right, because they're a bit fed up with paying for uh, for Ukraine, and they have a soft spot also, uh, many of them have soft spots for Putin. But regarding NATO, what will it do? Will uh, is threatened to, he can't, he's, he's a bit unpredictable. At some time he said that uh, he would not, uh, he, he doesn't, uh, it would disengage from NATO, and it would leave uh, European pe European leaders uh, really in the lurch. At the same time, I think Trump would uh, we would want to keep NATO because NATO has become a way of selling uh, American weapons, and it's therefore very good for uh, the American industry. And uh, Trump, being very aware of that, would probably soften his apparently radical stance or attitude towards the future of NATO. Jacques, uh, I want to bring in Peter. Peter, give us your impression of who do you think Olaf Scholz would rather work with? Would he be happier with Harris or does he get on better with Trump? Do you think he would, he would, which would he rather have? 
I mean, I have to say, imagine Olaf Scholz happy is just very difficult for me in any <laughs> regards. Um, but, you know, I think that he would consider Harris a more reliable and more predictable partner, and, I, and that that would be very central to the sort of German political establishment's understanding of what would be important for an American president right now is indisputable. You know, that the, the broad um, center of the German political establishment would rather work with Harris seems very clear. With that said, I think one has to be clear that, you know, when I first came to Germany, it was 2004, and I got to Berlin, and I was a 20-year-old kid, and old people would hear my accent, my American accent, and they'd stop me on the street, and they'd tell me how grateful they were for the raisin bombers that dropped raisins on their heads during the after the Second World War. And, you know, there was even, you know, I've interviewed people on the far, far left of German politics who talked really about what an ideal leadership America had provided for them. You know, people who were very opposed to American politics in a lot of senses still talked about the sort of symbolic value to Germany of American politics. And I think that was gone the first time Trump was elected. And I think now, even if we get Harris back, the idea that America presents a kind of beacon for democracy and freedom, which was always, an, you know, it was always a problematic ideal. I know that. But there was something real about it until Trump was elected. And I think now, even if Harris is president again, it's just, it's lost. That's an innocence that's gone. William, whoever wins this election, European leaders will have to work with them. Um, do you think if it is Trump that we will see a year of far-right rises again? I mean, 2024 has been historic in many ways for some of the results we've seen. 2025 going forward, can you see the far-right gaining in ground if Trump is president of the United States once more? Um, yeah, I can, I can certainly see a lot of the movements becoming emboldened, um, becoming, yeah, more kind of vocal um, with kind of legitimation. I mean, 2024 has been quite unprecedented in terms of a year of elections. Um, so there might be a bit more of a, um, a kind of breather in terms of publics being um, sent to the polls. Um, but in terms of, yeah, further elections uh, we see coming down the line um, in, yeah, across the continent, then um, certainly kind of see this kind of ramping up of, of the far right. Um, if it was to, to come to pass in the US kind of, yeah, further, um, yeah, emboldening people. I mean, we have to also bear in mind that um, these parties, they, they don't just live off demand, but they also have to organize themselves. Um, and these are fringe parties, um, by and large. I mean, some have entered government, but others are, are quite small, um, small fry. Um, so there's there's certain barriers there um, they'll have to face, um, as well as um, the salience of of some of their their kind of issue um, kind of bases that they also um, try to thrive off. So yeah, there's some limitations there. Um, and and yeah. William, just tell me. Is there an argument that a Trump win would force more of the mainstream parties to actually look at issues that he keeps banging on about, like migration, everything that fans the flames of the far right, mm. that they may have to work harder towards dealing with people's legitimate concerns? Yeah, I mean, I think I think they already are, um, would be answered to that question. Um, I think the whole migration issue um, has entered um, the mainstream, uh, a lot of parties and governments trying to deal with this uh, increasingly kind of strong, robust language, even from um, for, well, still left-wing parties, but trying to, to come across as kind of hard on the issue. Shaq, I'm sure, like the rest of us, your president will be staying up very late into the early hours of the morning, watching TV, watching state by state. Who do you think Emmanuel Macron wants to win? Well, Harris, obviously. It's no, no, it's it's quite clear. Uh, Aris would not be idea. Aris would still uh, be defending America of uh, all and uh, disregard our allies, especially in the field of economic policy. 
uh, we see the way the Inflation Reduction Act of uh, of uh, Joe Biden that it really damaged uh, in industrial prospects for Europe. We see that many companies rather would rather invest now in the US rather than in Europe because the incentives are there, the cost of energy is lower, there are subsidies and so on. We have unfair competition with Iris, but that only concerns the economy. Regarding the security and the future of the European project to which Macron is very attached, obviously he will want Harris because he knows that the Trump victory combined with his uh, relation almost friendly with Trump would probably could spell the dismantling of the European Union. Jack, Peter and William here with me in the studio. Thank you all so much for your insight on this one. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.